Hi, Nancy. Hello. <laughs> what a gift to be able to hang with you here oh, at the cabin. It's and been wonderful. Thank you, honey. Oh, it's been such a privilege to hear your music and kind of connect with the Jesus movement mm -hmm. and everything that you saw firsthand. You know, I've read about it in books and watched films, but you were right there in the thick of it. Yeah, I got born again right in 1970. What toward the very beginning of it, so and praise take the your, Lord. And your music career just went around the world, and your ministry, um, not just a musician, but also really a missions heart, and taking the gospel and preaching to nations and peoples all around the world, and using music to do that. Even I love how you learned your songs in different languages so that you could really connect with the people. Yeah. Well, that definitely developed over time. At first, I was just very local, you know, uh, fell in love with Jesus in Fort Wayne, Indiana, through the witness of some wonderful Jesus people there, and uh, was involved in a local coffee house ministry called Adam's Apple that for the first um, several years, basically, I, I just ventured out to, like, Indiana, Michigan, Ohio, Illinois, you know, not very far. But I was growing in the Lord and getting rooted. I think that was so important to get rooted in the Word, rooted in good fellowship and mm. discipleship. In 1973, it was three years after I got saved, I recorded my first album, which was picked up by Word. So then exposure started getting much more... Um, far farther from home through radio and mm -hmm. and things like that so people started inviting me but still I wouldn't say that I had a missions heart at that time I was basically just doing concerts in English wherever I went and mm -hmm. um, thinking of it more as just a Jesus person being able to share my testimony and uh, not necessarily having a burden for people in other cultures or anything. I think at the beginning I was basically pretty, uh, you know, myopic really, just seeing my, how Jesus was affecting my life and talking about that, you know. Wasn't really thinking very much about what other people were going through. But as life goes on, you know, you just become more... Um, you know, more aware that you could help somebody else. Mm -hmm. And first of all, the, the, the new field that, after the Jesus movement, the new field that the Lord opened up was singles ministry, which I was single. And so the Lord was really dealing with me about that and gave me a burden to minister to people in a specific field of singles. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and so kind of for the first time in my life, I really started writing a song from somebody else's point of view. Mm. Although that actually had happened to me once before during my more self-centered writing stage, I read a book uh, written by Johnny Erickson Tata and wrote a song for her called Johnny's Waltz. Aww. And it turned out she was a fan of the Evergreen album and had those songs, you know, all going through her head. Wow. Uh, when, when, when she was making that film of her life that was called Johnny. Wow. She used the Evergreen album as part of her escape from the pressure of it and refresh and stuff. How so cool is I that? I found that out, you know, after I wrote her that song. But other than that, I really, for, for maybe a good, uh, let me see, 10 years at least, uh, basically just wrote about me and Jesus and what was happening in my life mm. and the changes that were happening in me. Wow. And obviously there's been this kind of metamorphosis that we all go through and then the Lord gives us vision for other ways that our music can yeah. be used. How did, how did that happen for you? Well, for me, I, I went through a very painful transition time um, at the end of the 70s into the early 80s, um, it seemed like the anointing to minister to young people was lifting off of my life. And the young people that were coming, coming forward at that time 
were just a different group that I didn't relate to as well. Um, and it wasn't like the Lord immediately told me what to do about that either. There was a, there was a good long stretch there for maybe four years where I felt like I'd sort of outlived the, the will of God and uh, was really struggling emotionally with that. And then, um, but I was faithful to continue to sing and minister the best I could. And then um, he, he brought me in contact with a guy named Mike Cavanaugh from Elam Bible Institute that started a singles ministry called Mobilize to Serve. And Mike invited me to sing and he preached a message on undivided devotion, mm -hmm. which just revolutionized my life. I like just, it's like I got saved all over again. I just decided I was single, and, but I had been single in the sense of every year I would pray, okay, Lord, you've, I give you 12 months to find me a husband kind of a thing. Yeah. It wasn't an unconditional surrender, but I did surrender unconditionally to the Lord, and I made a decision whether I get married or not. I'm going to serve you with no strings attached and no, no conditions. Mm -hmm. And so that started a new creative flow. And I started to write songs like Single Heart and Tell Me What Love Is and Every Single Day and um, uh, Jesus Be the Daddy in Our House, which were focused on a new field of people, single mm. adults. And that was, that was a, a maturing mm. for me. Rather than seeing myself as being an artist in kind of a generic sense, mm -hmm. I became more like, this is my field of mission and I, I'm going to sing with purpose wow. for this particular group of people. Wow. And that was a, that was a maturing for mm. me. And it was exciting, you know, because I didn't feel confused and lost and sort of purposeless anymore. So I had a field, a mission field. And then wow. after I was in, served the Lord in that sort of mind space, for about seven years, then my husband Jr. came along. Wow, that <laughs> seven-year cycle. Yeah, <laughs> it's like kicked something kicked in. Wow. It did, yeah, and he came along, and we fell in love, and served side by side in the singles ministry, and fell in love, and got married. And uh, we were married for 28 years almost, and he went to be with the Lord just three years in May of 2018. Wow. So. And during that time, he was very mission-minded. He loved missionaries, which scared me. But I, you know, I, I, I went along with his idea of being hospitable to missionaries. And um, the Lord just really called me to learn to speak Spanish and uh, hmm. sing in Spanish and concentrate on that. And so um, ever since the early 90s, I've been studying Spanish. Wow, and now you've been all around the world. I've been in 37 countries. And um, since I realized I could sing in Spanish, then I eventually got the idea, well, maybe I could sing, you know, in other languages. And so like everywhere I went, then after that, I just asked them to help me translate one of my songs. Wow. or several of them. And you're still, one thing I found was just really beautiful is that you're still a worship leader today in your church. Like you're the main worship leader. And then they, you know, send you when you're, you know, need to go out and minister somewhere. But that is so amazing. Like the call of God just, it's like it doesn't have an expiration date. No. Like we just keep doing it. And like no. he keeps blessing and bringing forth fruit. I yeah. love that. You've been so faithful for so many decades. There's so many expressions of music ministry. You know, mm. worship leading is one of them. Kind of like the Holy Ghost hammers it into you over the years of, you know, to mm. survive. I mean, you, you're, you're out there on the road. You better be learning from the Lord as you're going along. You know, how, what works. Yeah. And, um, and so he, he's been very faithful to train me all along the way. Uncharted wilderness stretches before you, and you thrive on going when no one has gone. Still, it gets lonely when darkness deepens. So, see. By 
amazing to have you here thank you to have you at the cabin and just get to jam a little bit mm -hmm. pioneers is probably pioneers probably my favorite song like wow. people will ask me what my favorite song is wow and like, there's a song pioneers like I, I i just resonate with it so deeply yeah well pioneer was written really after the jesus movement looking back at it uh, and from my point of view the jesus movement was basically in the 70s and a little bit into the 80s. And then um, the, the, as, as I think it's just a normal spiritual rhythm, um, revivals don't last forever. They, they're like a, a wave, a momentum. A, uh, they last for a good long time, hopefully, but then they do come to an end. And um, so as I was just looking back at it, even it was written in 1989. So I was looking back at it with a little bit of perspective and um, thinking how very grateful I was to be considered in a peer group of like Larry Norman and Second Chapter of Acts and Love Song and Barry McGuire and some of these Jamie Owens Collins and Keith, Green, Keith and Melody Green and, um, you know, John Fisher and uh, Randy Matthews, just Randy Stonehill. I mean, I don't want to, it's not, that's not an exhaustive list, but Phil Kagey, you know. Um, I, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, but just to, the privilege of being considered to be one of the Jesus Movement pioneers mm -hmm. and um, what, you know, how grateful I am for that was really the inspiration mm -hmm. for the song. And when I just started writing, I didn't really foresee that I was going to be bringing out um, a little bit of the hard part of that you, you're sort of, to be a pioneer, it means that you're sort of ahead of your time. People don't know you to begin with. Um, you're, you're starting, you're building from the bottom up, you know. And even in, in for some odd reason, uh, in contemporary Christian music, there's a phenomenon of, there's no recollection even of who was there at the beginning. And so- Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's and so- It's a big debate. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I actually really have a hard time envying the the country music community for how well they seem to remember the older ones and, and cherish them and bring them into events and things like that. But contemporary Christian music doesn't do that at all. It's true. It's very sad. And so, um, so, so there's, a, there's a part, you know, but you can't look back. You've got to keep pressing through. Uh, people are going to come along and do this bigger and better and faster than you. Uh, but you've still got a wilderness pathway. 
and only the Father goes before you. You know, like it was like it's not over with if you you are still a pioneer. And so when we got together in um, Forest Home in California and uh, did a beautiful um, gathering that was, it was called the First Love DVD. And I got to sing that song, which was the first time they had heard it. And the expressions and the tears and the uh, feelings that you can see on their faces was just priceless and I am so thankful for that but that you know basically I was thinking about Jesus music but you know it's really an interesting thing as a songwriter because your song if it's if it if it's purposeful in the Lord and if it's Holy Spirit inspired and so forth I don't mean in the same sense as the Bible or anything but right. You know, if there's sure. that spark of divine anointing. inspiration, anointing in Spirit, it, yeah. then it will go off and do its own thing. Yeah. And it'll come back and sort of like report to you, like, this is what I'm really all about. You know, so like YWAM got all excited about the Pioneer song and different things, which it, it, had, it became a mission cry, which actually I didn't, hadn't had in mind, but, um, but I learned, you know. Uh, I learned from it, and so that that's an exciting thing when your own song comes back and teaches you something that you didn't even really intend, but uh, the Lord knew all about it, you know. So cool. Well, that's beautiful. That's like the surrendered servant, though. Like, that's what we all long for is to be useful to the Lord and with our creative calling, create mm -hmm. something beautiful and that moves people into something that's useful to him. You know Amen. what I mean? How beautiful is that? What a legacy that is. Well, and what a privilege and how fun. I mean, to get to serve the Lord in music mm -hmm. all my life. I'm just totally grateful for that mm -hmm. because it's so much fun. So do you have any advice for people who feel like they're pioneering and they're just out there doing what mm. God has called them to do, but maybe they're feeling like, I'm just alone on this big old stage, you know? And do um, you have any encouragement for people? I do. I mean, it's, I believe that God calls people to pioneer, but that doesn't mean we don't need fellowship. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be in community somehow with other believers, if at all possible. And, uh, and submit ourselves, you know, to the, to the, the fellowship and the, the just discipleship that happens when you're in the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. I do believe that God raises up pioneers to go before to do things that um, haven't been done that way, but um, also he has given wonderful pastors who have that kind of heart themselves, e even though they're in the pastor role more than the um, evangelist role or the prophet or the, you know, person who's always pushing the edges. But, um, but somehow they have that heart and that ability to pastor someone and without uh, fencing them in, you know. And that is, I think, extremely important. If you're a pioneer, you should, you know, have some kind of way that you're connected to the body of Christ, some kind of mentor, and you definitely need some prayer warriors. Um, All these different aspects of community. You know, community is way more than just having a potluck dinner yeah. right after church, right? Yeah. It's like these, I love what you're saying, it's strategic ways that community enables us to do what God's called us to do. Mm. You know, the idea of having a soul friend, having mentors, having prayer covering, having pastors in your life who understand your calling mm -hmm. and your unique anointing and being able to release you and, and back you in that. Yes. Like all of those are aspects of community. Yeah. Like even, even someone who's called to music and going out and being on a stage, it's like having aspects of community around you is 
from what I'm hearing you saying, it's so vital and yes. something that you encourage other people to I do. I do, definitely. I, I uh, develop a, a prayer covering. Um, and then I think uh, you, to me, are a shining example of someone who has a very artistic and um, uh, bold and ambitious. You have a, a holy ambition that the Lord has given you, but it's tempered by reality and practicality. So you have learned to, um, you know, I think there's pioneers out there that have never really done anything because they have a certain vision, and until it just drops in their lap uh, divinely, supernaturally, they're still waiting on it. I have so been there. <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think that as we are willing to work with the financial and uh, other logistical realities of life, for example, family, you know, I mean, I've, I've been uh, a pioneering Christian music for 51 years, but there have been times when marriage and child rearing and care, caregiving of my father and different things have brought more of a structure of, uh, I have less time to just run off and go to Pakistan or something, you know. So, um, so there are those times, logistical, practical, family responsibility times that we, that th th I think the Lord wants us to honor. Mm -hmm. And, but thank God for the, the freedom that he gives us to, to express our calling. But if we can find a way to practically get started mm -hmm. in some way, rather than just waiting for it to supernaturally drop in our lap, I think that's what you have done so beautifully. There's certain things you'll never get until you get started. Yeah. And it's that moving forward. And like you were saying, those seasons of how you learn to know the Lord better because you're moving forward. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those moving forward places are not easy. They can be very humbling. Yeah. But we approach it with excellence, a spirit of excellence, and do, do it with all our heart to the Lord. And he loves that. I think it's uh, what one of the things I've learned is that it's so much more important to be strategic than to be like famous. Wow. Could you say that again? That was yes. really good. <laughs> I, I believe that God does give fame at times. He opens the door and he gives fame and he uses that for his purposes. But fame is fleeting. It never lasts. There's always an up and a down. And you have to negotiate the transitions into uh, post fame, you know, usefulness. And during those times, you realize that I would much rather be strategic in the plans of the Lord because Jesus has a harvest to gather in. You know, he shed his blood and purchased men from every tribe and tongue and nation and family. And he, he has asked us to be laborers in his harvest field. And, and what a huge privilege that is. And he's the one that has the plan for how he's going to bring in this, the end time harvest. So our job is to be strategically where he wants us to be. And so fame has very little to do with it. I mean, it may come into it or it may not. So, but to accomplish his strategy, we do find a wonderful satisfaction that's actually better than fame. Because fame, although it's exciting, um, is also very difficult. And it's a trial of its own. Because um, there are many unclean spirits that you have to fight fight and uh, there's very little time for yourself um, you know you you get exhausted 
um, it's in some ways not fun, but it can be, it can be very exciting, but also it can be exhausting and, and there's trials that come along with it. So, um, when, when we're not famous, if we're strategic, boy, that just pleases the Lord. And that's what it's all about, isn't Amen. it? <laughs> so good. Yes.